Hi, Ian. Hello. Okay, we got two of you in here. This is uh, Thursday's lecture, Redux. I didn't realize that uh, they canceled classes on, on Thursday, so I went in and I did my morning Zoom. And uh, actually, I got through a whole lot of stuff on Thursday. So I'm hoping I get to the same place. All right. We doing okay? Okay. All right, so. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad? Hmm. I wonder where my, hmm, that's interesting. Sorry, I'm trying, I thought I had my, uh, thought I had my uh, PowerPoint up there already, but apparently I didn't. Okay. And I think we're still in chapter 10. I'll figure it out in a second, yep. Okay, what we're gonna go through today, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna review Lewis Dots, the octet rule thing. I'm gonna go through formal charges very, very quickly. Uh, did I go through formal charges with you the la on Thursday, on Tuesday, Tuesday? Formal charges are where you figure out what the atom normally has if it's not in the molecule. And then what we do is we try and figure out what the charge on that atom is within the molecule. This was the formal charge is equal to normal valence electrons minus lone pair electrons plus bonding electrons divided by two. Does that strike any sort of, or are we out in left field here? To be honest, I'm out because I wasn't here on Tuesday. Okay, Ian, do you remember? Uh, faintly, but not much. I apologize. Okay. No, that's fine. We'll, we'll go ahead and do this. Um, sorry. I need to get back to where I need to be. There we are. Okay. All right. Now, if, if you are in the third shell or more, I'm gonna go down to, if I find the periodic table here, should be somewhere about, unless I eliminated it. There we go. All right. If you're in the third shell, remember if N is equal to three, L can be two, one, or zero. In other words, there are D electrons. There are D orbitals. When we're discussing orbitals in the quantum theory, you have to understand hydrogen does have two S orbitals. It does have two P orbitals. They're just not filled, okay? So if my compound is in the second shell, that means that it cannot fill. The 3D is too far away from the second shell. So it can't employ the 3D uh, electrons. However, if I go down to the third shell, the three Ps, those can employ D electrons or D orbitals to add ele extra electrons around the center atom. So what this means is that sulfur can have more than eight electrons around its center atom. Oxygen can't. Phosphorus, arsenic can have more than eight electrons around the center atom. Nitrogen cannot. Does that make sense, first of all? Come on, I need an amen. I need some sort of comment back. Yeah, for the most part. All right, so this compound exists. Sulfur hexafluoride does exist, okay? If I'm drawing a Lewis dot structure of sulfur hexafluoride, then because the fluorines have only one, elect one unpaired electron, they can't bond to themselves in something else. They can only bond to one thing. This means if that compound exists, each one of the fluorines must be attached to the center atom. So this means 
If I, that is the case, this means sulfur has two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 bonding electrons around it. So therefore it has more than eight electrons. It breaks the octet rule. Does this make sense, guys? Yes. I have yeah. phosphorus, phosphorus pentachloride. If I have phosphorus pentachloride, then I have to have 10 electrons around the phosphorus. All right. Now, those electrons do not necessarily have to be bonding electrons. If I have xenon tetrafluoride, in order, xenon tetrafluoride has 36 valence electrons. In order to draw a Lewis dot structure of xenon tetrafluoride, I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. I have four extra electrons. They have to be put around the xenon as lone pairs. Am I saying anything that doesn't make sense here, guys? No, it makes sense. All right, now I'm gonna stop share for a second and I am going to go into the whiteboard. All right, this compound exists. That compound exists in the real world, okay? But right. this has, uh, let's, let's undo this for a second. Let's make something that makes, let's do another compound. Okay, that compound does exist. Beryllium has two valence electrons, hydrogen has one, but there are two of them. So it's two times one. So if I draw this, I have four electrons. Mm -hmm. One goes that way. One goes this way. So does it matter if, the, if an H is on top, H is on bottom? Like does the orientation really matter? You mean, are you asking, could I draw it like this? Yes. And then an H on the bottom. It doesn't really matter because okay. in space, what would happen is these would rotate. Okay. It's the whole molecule rotating. And if the whole molecule rotates, then you have this again. I have a question then. If, if it doesn't matter with... How do you determine linear and bent then? We're going to get to that today. Okay. We're going to get to Vesper today. All right. So I don't have any more electrons, do I? I get two, four. Beryllium only has four electrons around it. Yet I know the compound exists. So the octet rule can be broken the other way as well. If I know something exists and this is the best I can do, it's the best I can do. Now, one more thing. If I have NO2, I know NO2 exists. It's actually one of the gases that's used in uh, acid rain. This reacts with water to make nitric acid. But five and 12, I have 17 electrons. I'm gonna draw this real quick, I'm not gonna Okay, because I have an odd number, I'm gonna have an extra electron there that I have to put on the center atom. 
I have an odd number of electrons. If I have an odd number of electrons, there's no way I'm gonna get eight electrons around that nitrogen. Now, when you see this, this is something called a free radical. Free radicals don't like to exist. They like to pair up their electrons. So this particular compound is highly reactive. And if it even sees water, it will react to make nitric acid. So those are the three different types of examples about how a structure, how a structure can disobey the octet rule. Now, sometimes we have different ways to draw, to draw compounds. Write this down, make sure you know it. If you don't like to count the bonding electrons divided by two, what you can substitute this is number of bonds because it's the same number. Okay. Now, remember when we drew carbon dioxide, we could draw it like this. Or we could draw it like this. Remember that guys, when I had that, either one of these is a legitimate Lewis dot structure. Now we have to decide which one is better. So we do formal charge, okay? And the formal charge, first rule, least amount. That's an S. Least amount of formal charge is one of the deciding factors on which one we choose. The second one is negative sign. I can't draw this crap. Sign. Ah. Is on the electronegative Adam, I know this is horrible. All right, so if I'm gonna use formal charge, there are six normal electrons around oxygen. Right guys? Right? Right. This has, remember this is lone pair of electrons. So I have two, four. plus four bonding electrons. That has a zero. The orientation about this one is the same as this one. So that one is zero. If I'm looking at carbon, that is four minus zero plus eight over two. So this one is also zero. This carbon, same thing, four, my, uh, undo, 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 thank you. Four minus zero plus eight over two. So it is zero. This oxygen, on the other hand, is six minus two plus six over three, over two rather. So this oxygen is a plus one. 
This oxygen is six minus six plus two over two. for a minus one. Now, when I tell you to look at the least amount of formal charge, what I'm not telling you to do is I'm not telling you to just add everything up because if I add up everything for both of these, it both comes out to zero. The formal charge will be whatever the charge of the molecule is. What I'm looking at are how many atoms have charges on them and if the charges are greater than one. So in this case, we have two, the two oxygens have charges on them. These two oxygens don't. This is the favored, the favored uh, structure. We have that guys? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do I, need, do I need to go through one more example? Uh, do you mind doing one? <laughs> Thank you. CSN to minus one charge. So the N has five electrons, carbon four valence electrons, so for six plus the one for the negative charge. Therefore, this is 16 electrons. That's one choice. I can do it this way. Or I could do it this way. Do you see that these are three different compounds? Does that, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So now we have to figure out which one is the best structure. All right, Gabe. Mm -hmm. How many valence electrons? The one on the you? middle on the right, aren't they the same? Oh, that's this true. I'd have figured it out eventually. Now are they different? Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you, Gabe. All right. So if I'm dealing with this nitrogen, mm -hmm. how many valence electrons does it have? As two. No, valence electrons normally. Oh, oh, oh. It's. You got to get this down, guys. You got to get this down. This should be an immediate response. You should be able to look at a periodic table, count over, and be able to tell me that nitrogen has five. Yeah, okay. Five. All right, Gabe. How many lone pair electrons are around this nitrogen? Uh, two. No. Two mm. pairs. How many electrons? Four. Four electrons. Plus, how many bonding electrons? Four, right. So what is the charge on this nitrogen? Negative one. Okay. Now, I'm gonna deal with this carbon and I'm also gonna look at these two at the same time because it's the same number, okay? Okay. How many normal valence electrons around carbon? Four. How many lone pairs? Four, no. Zero, okay, that's, yeah, zero, okay. How many bonding electrons? Eight. And the reason I'm going to lump the carbons in it is, is to save time. So if this is the case, what is the charge on my carbon? Uh, you don't have a charge, or zero. There we go. Okay, now, 
Let's look at this carbon. Does it also have no lone pairs and eight bonding electrons? Yes. So what's the charge on this one? Zero. Let's look at this one. Yeah, also okay. zero. <laughs> okay, so that's why I wanted to save a little time there. All right. Okay. Now, let's look at this sulfur. Mm -hmm. How many valence electrons? Uh, uh, six. Lone pair electrons? Zero. No. Oh, 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 sorry. I was looking at the one on the way to the end. It has three, so six. No. No. This is not a lone pair. This is an arrow. Oh, oh, oh. So it'd be four. Four. How many bonding electrons does it have? Four. So what's the charge on the sulfur? It is zero also. All right. Which makes sense. This whole thing is a negative one charge. It's an ion. So if you add up all the formal charge, you will get the charge of the ion. Okay, Ian. That nitrogen. Yeah. That nitrogen. Okay. How many valence electrons? Five. Five. How many lone yeah. pair electrons? Would it be two? Yeah. Or would this? Oh yeah. Okay. It's two because we're looking at, by lone pair electrons, I want the electrons that are just around the nitrogen. They're nitrogen's electrons. Okay. They're not sharing them. Okay, how many right. bonding electrons are there? Six. So what is the charge on that nitrogen? Uh, nine, wait, what the hell? Five minus two plus six over two. Oh, zero. Jesus, I don't know why I couldn't do that. <laughs> All right, now let's do the sulfur. What's the normal valence around sulfur? Uh, six. Lone pair electrons. Six. Bonding electrons. Two. What's the charge on the sulfur? Negative one. Negative one. All right. Now, Ian, while well, I got you, do this one. Okay. Um, six. Yep. And then. So what's normal valence electrons? Oh, wait. Five, my bad. Okay. Minus. Six. Plus. Uh, two. Two over two. So if I've got five minus six plus two over two, what's the charge negative. on this? Negative, negative two. two. Okay, Gabe, last one. So. Hey, let's electrons around sulfur. Gabe. Uh, six. Okay. Lone pair electrons? Two. Bonding electrons? Six. What's the charge on that sulfur? Seven? No. Nope. Six minus, oh, sorry, no, 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 my bad. Uh, okay, yeah, that was my question. I'm like, why is that a negative? Okay, my bad. so it would be one. Positive one. All right, now, remember what I said about formal charges, guys. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for the least amount of formal charge. Can you see that this one, that should be a one. Can you see that this one has a whole bunch of formal charge on it? So I'm gonna dismiss yeah. it right away. All right, now I gotta look at these two. Same amount of formal charge, right? Right. So I got to go to my second rule. The negative charge has to be on the more electronegative element. If I were to tell you that nitrogen is more electronegative than sulfur, which is the favored formula? Uh, it would be the first one. Did you see that, Ian? 
Yes. Okay. That's what, that is what we do formal charge for. Question about that? No. Okay, I gotta go through a couple things and I'm gonna be doing them real quick. Okay? Partially it has to do with the fact that I'm gonna discuss some of this stuff later. And actually both of them I'm gonna discuss later. And partially it's because it's something that you're going to get or you're not going to get. All right. Resonance. Resonance is the ability to manipulate double and triple bonds within a molecule. In other words, if you can draw two Lewis structures that are equal to, to each other, its only difference is in the fact that you have manipulated the double bond from one position to another, then you have resonance. Do we kind of understand what I'm talking about? Sort of. Sort of. Okay, let's go through an example. This molecule here, are you seeing the screen by the way? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this molecule here is ozone. This is ozone. Now, Ian, is there any reason the right oxygen is special? No. Then why did I put the double bond there? Couldn't the double bond just as easily have been put over on this one? No, because it's got a negative charge. Well, if I put the double bond on this one, that would make this oxygen have a negative charge, right? Correct. So could it just as easily have been placed over here? Yes. So basically it can be in either positions, right? Right. So what happens? We make double bonds from three pi I'm sorry, sorry, from free P orbitals. We use, basically, we use a P orbital that is here and one that's here. So in order to make a double bond, you have to have a free P orbital. So these two have two free P orbitals, so it can have a double bond. But so does this one. So the electron spends some time over here, then it spends some time between these two p orbitals. And in effect, what happens is the electrons get spread out amongst the whole molecule. And when it gets spread out amongst the whole molecule, it makes the molecule that much stronger. It is called resonance. If I were to look, if I were to sit and measure an ozone molecule. If it were in one position and it weren't spread out like that, then one of the bonds would be shorter than the other because this has more electrons. They suck each other in a little more. So this bond would be shorter than this one. But if we go ahead and do the measurement, the bond lengths are the same. Because the bond lengths are the same, then the bonds must be the same. If the bonds are the same, that means we are spreading the electrons throughout the entire molecule. Is that making sense to you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you might like to think of resonance as like mixing yellow and blue paint and you get green. If you have two resonance structures, you have one that's on the left side, one that's on the right, you mix them together and you get this blending of the electrons where they're spread throughout the entire molecule. Gabe, is there any reason, is there anything special about the horizontal oxygen as opposed to the vertical oxygen? No. Can they, be exchanged. Can I can I move no. the double can I move the double bond down here? 
And would it be an equal structure? No. Why not? Because doesn't one of the O's have uh, two bonds? Right, I'm take, when I'm taking, Gabe, when I'm, when I'm doing my drawings, instead of putting the double bond there, I'm putting it here. And instead of this one having four lone pairs, it now has six. Oh yeah, that, that would work. Okay, so I can make this into a resonant structure. I can manipulate the double bonds, correct? Correct. All right, I'm gonna stop share for a second, go back to the whiteboard. Now, if I had this molecule, This is called ethene. It does exist. Is there any other way I can put any other place on this molecule that I can put that double bond? No. No. No other place. Just, yeah. It has to be there. It can't, I can't put a double bond here. Okay. Likewise, let's do this. Can I manipulate these double bonds? I have two of them. Can I manipulate them in any way? Uh, you, couldn't you put a third one on either side or can you take one? Yeah, you could do that. You could, what you're saying is take this over here and do this. Right, yes, correct. You could or do vice that. Versa. You could do that and it does show some degree of resonance. But literally speaking, if I do the formal charge here, well, well first of all, no, I can't. And so no. I had to look at the molecule again. No, I can't. How many electrons are around carbon? Like with the, with the one that we just moved? Yes. Uh, six? Nope, two, four, six, no. eight, ten. Uh, ten, there are, ten. There are ten, so I can't move this bond over there. Okay. Wait, why not? Because if I move this bond over here, yes, this carbon still has eight. This one only has six now, right? Oh, oh, and this oh. This one like has it, 10. No way so, in the world is that going to work. Because the octet rule, right? It's like eight. The octet rule and the fact that carbon is in the second shell. It can't get extra. Oh. It can't get extra electrons. So this carbon can't have that any extra electrons. So then there won't be a resonance? No, can, cannot, yeah. cannot have resonance. Okay. So that's what I'm telling you. Resonance involves not only having the double and triple bonds, but being able to manipulate them within the molecule. Okay. If I have this, Does this have resonance? No. Can I write, can I write this such that I have, by the way, there's an extra bond up there. Uh, um, no. Can I write this? Haven't I moved the, haven't I moved the double bond from one side to the other? Yes. So do I have oh, resonance wait. here? Two, four, six, eight. Oh my gosh. Okay, you could have, yeah. All right. So by the way, this doesn't exist. The SE should be in the center here. I just did that real quick off the top of my head. And when I ad lib, I get myself in trouble. So are you kind of understanding resonance now? Kind of. Kind of? Again, yeah, yes. this is gonna be something, okay. If you get into organic chemistry, you're gonna need it. 
You're going to absolutely need to understand resonance and all its applications. If you don't, this is kind of like a one and done thing. All right. Uh, professor, maybe after class, um, I can stay for like 10 minutes before my math class. I have a few questions on like the, the shells that you're talking about. Okay. So we can, we can go through that after. Okay, no okay. problem. No problem. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. The second thing I need to talk about is polar covalent bonds. All right. I'm sitting here wondering whether I want to spend the time. Let me stop. Uh, professor? Gonna, yeah. Is our uh, final cumulative or is it just yes. on the new material? Yes. Oh, man. Okay. It's sorry, okay. I have to make it that way. Uh, okay. What am I doing? I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm going up. I'm going up, going up, going up. No, I'm not going up. I am doing this. Okay. I'm trying to find a video. Yes, okay. Two minutes, two minutes of your life, you'll never get back. Okay, stop, stop. All right, now, gotta find where I'm at here. Okay, boom, boom, okay, we got it. Tell me if you can't hear this, all right? Welcome to Dogs Teaching Chemistry. Our first lesson is chemical bonding. Chemical bonds are what holds atoms together. Are you guys hearing me now? Yeah. Maybe. All right. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Are you seeing something that says a blank? Are you seeing a blank screen on the TV? On the on your yeah. video. Dogs teaching okay. chemistry. Yeah. Welcome to Dogs Teaching Chemistry. Our first lesson is chemical bonding. Chemical bonds are what holds atoms together. A chemical bond is an attraction between atoms that allows the formation of a chemical substance. The electrons that participate in a chemical bond are called valence electrons. These are electrons that are found in an atom's outermost shell. Let's take a look at the types of chemical bonds that can be formed between atoms. An ionic bond is formed when one of the atoms will lose its electron to the other atom. This results in a positively charged ion, called a cation, and a negatively charged ion, called an anion. Positive and negative attract, and the result is an ionic bond. Covalent chemical bonds involve the sharing of a pair of valence electrons by two atoms. There is also what is called polar covalent bonds. These are covalent bonds in which the sharing of the electron pair is unequal. The result is a bond where the electron pair is displaced toward the more electronegative atom. Thanks for watching! And we'll see you guys next time.
Okay. Cute dogs. <laughs> how, how she ever got them to do that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, she probably has too much time on her hands. Okay, so like the dog said, if an atom is more electronegative than the partner it's sharing electrons with, the electrons are going to spend more time around that atom than the other one. Okay, if I have a F2, these are two equally electronegative atoms. So the electrons spend equal time. But with HF, the electrons spend more time around F a little bit of time around H, more time around H, or more time around F. So bottom line, what happens is I get a slight negative charge on the more electronegative atom. So that it can be done, it can be marked in a couple ways. One of which is you can mark this thing as a small case delta. If you put a small case delta with a positive or negative, that indicates that this atom is more electronegative and it has a slight negative charge to it. Now, if I have an ionic bond, basically the X has stolen the electron completely. If I have a pure covalent bond, these are sharing the electrons equally. So there's no charge. So this is something called a polar bond. This is something called a nonpolar bond. And it has everything to do with electronegativity. And electronegativity is nothing more than the ability of an atom to attract an electron to it. It's a, it's a relative scale. No, the fluorine is the most electronegative and uh, francium, one more, one more level down here, is the least electronegative. As you go up the periodic table and as you go over, from left to right, you get more electronegative. From bottom to top, you get more electronegative. Bottom line, if that electronegativity difference is between 0 and 0.5, you have a nonpolar bond, equal sharing. If it's between 0.5 and 2, you have an unequal sharing. That is a polar bond. Electronegative difference is greater than 2. Basically, when we get that high, we're talking about nonpolar atoms, and we're talking about, I'm oh, sorry, excuse me. We're talking about electronegative elements and non-electronegative elements. We're talking about nonmetals and metals. So what happens? We get shifting of the electrons to one side. That makes this a charged molecule. Charged molecules like being around other charged molecules. They don't like being around non-charged molecules. What happens is I get a changing of the charges on the molecule. So that if I put a magnetic field here with a positive side and a negative side, this molecule will rotate so that the negative end of the molecule is closer to the positive end of the magnetic field. Keep that in mind. We're going to use polar bonds and we're going to use the shapes of the molecules to discuss overall polarity of the individual molecules but we're probably not gonna to get to that until Thursday. All right, are we good here, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, excited, huh? Yeah, I gotta drag us kicking and screaming back into thermochemistry, all right? And you really have to pay attention to what I'm saying here, and I'm hoping I don't screw it up because I, I've done that in the past. Do you remember Hess's law, guys? Sum of the products of the enthalpies minus the sum of the reactants, right? Do you remember that? Or have you blocked it out of your mind entirely? I remember it. Me too, sadly. Uh, 
All right, so we're gonna do something. This is gonna be a little different. When we're dealing with bond energies, bond energies are the attraction one atom has for another one, okay? And when we, it takes energy, you have to put energy in to break bonds. Does that make sense? Yes, kind of. Okay, all right. Uh, who said kind of, is it Ian? No, Gabriel. Gabe, oh, sorry, Gabe. All sorry, right, Gabe. Gabe. You have an iron bar, okay? Right. You want to make two iron bars. Okay. It's going to take energy for you to either saw them apart or bend them back and forth. Is it going to take energy to you for you to break these two away from one another? Yes. So if course. you have a chemical bond, you got to put energy in to make them separate. Okay. So that is, you have to put positive energy in. All right? All right. On the other hand, when you have these two atoms out here and they decide to bond with one another, when they bond with one another, energy gets released. Breaking bonds, energy gets put in, positive. Forming bonds, energy gets released, negative. So what we're going to do when we're doing, when we're analyzing these particular subjects, we're going to look, we're going to see what bonds are broken. And we're going to put those all as being positive. We're going to find out which bonds are being formed. All those bonds are going to be negative. You will have a chart. Understand, these are all going to be positive numbers. It's all going to be the energy to require to break those bonds. But if those bonds are formed, remember, if the bonds are formed, we're subtracting those. If I'm breaking an FF bond, that's going to take me putting in 155 kilojoules per mole of energy. If I'm forming a CLF bond, that means that I am taking away energy because I formed the bond. Is that making a little bit of sense, guys? Yes. Yeah. So, if I have the simple equation, two hydrogens plus one oxygen molecule making two waters, I have to look and I have to analyze what's happening here. Each hydrogen molecule has how many HH bonds? Come on, guys. Uh, two. Now, if I have H, H2, right. how many HH bonds are there? One. Oh, there's one. one. There's one HH bond, but I have two molecules, right? Right. So, in effect, I have to break the first HH bond, and I have to break the second HH bond. So, if I look back on my chart, HH is 436. I'm breaking the bond. It's a positive number. So I'm going to multiply two of them because I have two bonds broken by the 436. How many bonds am I breaking with the O2? How many OO bonds are there in O2? One. One. Coefficient is one. So how many of those bonds am I breaking? One. One. So I'm breaking two HH bonds 
and I'm breaking one OO bond, okay? I'm breaking them, positive energy, okay? Now, I've got my waters. If I'm going to draw my H2O, I have H, O, and H, right? Mm -hmm. For each water, how many OH bonds do I have? Okay, I need to need to do something. Oh, it's up there. Okay. Are you seeing the whiteboard? Mm -hmm. Is that not water? Is yeah, that not water? Yeah, it is. That right. is. So how many OH bonds do I have to break? Two, two. two. One. two. I have to break two OH bonds. OK? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to go back here. So, by the way, do you like the whiteboard drawings? Yeah. So, they're good. Each water has two OH bonds. I have how many water molecules that formed? One. No, what's the number here, Gabe? How many water two, molecules am I two, making? Two, two. I'm making two water molecules. Thought, Each of them have two OH bonds. So how many? I thought you were OH talking about that Lewis structure you drew. No, no, I'm talking about the, this the compound. All right. Me too. So I have two molecules. Each of them have two OH bonds. How many OH bonds am I forming? Four. Four. So I've got four OH bonds forming, so I've got four times a negative 463. If I want to get the whole enthalpy of my reaction, I'm going to multiply two times my 436, take one times my 146 for the oxygen. From that, I'm going to subtract my four OH bonds, OK? I do this subtraction. I end up with a number, 834 kilojoules. But understand, that's kilojoules because I formed two molecules. That's kilojoules per two molecules, or two moles. For each to form one water, I would divide this number by two to be 417. Did you get that last part? Yeah. To get to form two water moles, I would be 118 minus 1852, a negative 834. But that's to form two moles of water. To form one mole of water, I would just divide the 834 by two. OK. Let's analyze this, OK? How many CH bonds do I break going from this to this? Ian's coming back. He must have got skipped out a second. Gabe. Yeah. Going from this compound to this one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to do this real quick. What is the difference between this compound? And this one.
How do I go from this to this? You get rid of an H. I have to get rid of a CH bond, one of them, right? Right. I have to minus a CH or, sorry, I have to break the bond. So that's positive energy to break that bond. And I get negative energy for the CCL. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll go back to, back to hopefully, stop share. So how many CH bonds did I say I broke? One. All right, do I have to break the CCL bond? The, C C the CLCL bond? No. Wait, yeah, you do. You have to break one for it to bond okay. with CH. So I have to break breaking. one CH bond and I have to break one CLCL bond, right? Right. What am I forming over here? A CH3CL. But which bond did I form? Uh, C C L or C C C H. No, not C C H. Oh no, it was already bonded. Sorry, it'd be C C H C L. Nope. Or no, C C L C C L. C C L. So I'm forming a C C L bond, and that H hooked up with the other C L. So I'm also an forming HCL. an H C L bond. So I look over here, these bonds are broken, positive energy. I look and find my CLCL, which is 242, positive. I'm looking at my CH, 413, positive. Minus my CCL, 328, plus, and again, this is all in brackets, my HCL, which is 431. All mm -hmm. I got to do is add those numbers up and I'm where I have to be. Jeez. Are we good? We kind of understanding what is going yeah. on. Kind of. Right? Yes. I would definitely practice. All right. This is the last problem I'm going to do on this in this field. All right. To go from this to this, what bonds had to be broken? Uh, the H. The How H4. many of them? All four of them. All four of them. So I'm breaking four CH bonds here. Mm. What, am I what am I breaking here? None. An OO bond. All right, remember. Remember, oh, is that Ian that said none? No, okay. that was me. I'm sorry, kid. All right. No, Remember, fine. when I'm forming this molecule, Lewis dot structure C, double bond O, double bond O on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. So this is OO. Are the O's together in this molecule? E no. No. Remember, it's C. Double bond O. So in order to go from this to this, did I have to break this bond? Yes. So I have four CHs that I broke. I have one OO that I broke. Now, again, you have to be able to draw Lewis dot structures to be able to do this. CO2, I have a carbon, double bond O, double bond O. How many C double bond O's did I form? Two. Two. So I formed two C double bond O bonds. All right. I can't do that. Okay. I'm going to go. Uh, this is what carbon dioxide looks like. Mm -hmm. Right, Gabe? Right. So 
Remember, I split the carbons up from the four, ox or four hydrogens. I split this oxygen into two. So this oxygen then had to form with the carbon to make this double bond. The second oxygen had to go with that same carbon to make the second double bond O. So what I did was I formed two carbon double bond O's. Okay, you got that, Gabe? Mm -hmm. All right, now, just like we did before, How many OH bonds am I breaking, Gabe? Two. How many molecules? Two. So how many OH total am I breaking? Or forming, forming? Four. So what I do, I broke four CH bonds, four times 413, which is the CH bond, plus one OO bond, 146, minus I formed two carbon double bond O's which is 799 mm -hmm. plus four times OH, which is 463. I add those all up or add and then subtract and I end up with 1652. Okay. All right. Okay, so that ends chapter that is the end of chapter um, 10. Questions about that? Why is it so hard? <laughs> <laughs> it's chemistry. Didn't I tell you, the first day of lecture, did I not say chemistry is very, 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 very hard? Yes, for sure. Okay, so test four, I'm into chapter 11 now. And we're going to erase that. Okay. Uh, let's see, I'm not showing the screen, so that means I'm not here. Share screen. Are you seeing the VSEPR screen now? Yeah. VSEPR stands for Valent Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. We're going to do a couple things in this, in this chapter. We're going to deal with the Vesper theory. We're going to deal with bond angles. We're also going to deal with polar, polar molecules, not bonds. We've already dealt with bonds. We're going to be dealing with polar molecules. Then we're going to get into another theory that's called hybridization. We're going to go into hybrid orbital diagrams. We'll talk about sigma pi bonds go into molecular orbital theory, which involves bonding and anti-bonding electrons, bond order, and we're gonna predict para and diamagnetism. Oh boy, strap yourselves in. Vesper, Vesper's a theory that we're going to be able to determine the geometric structure of a molecule by pushing each electron cloud away from each other. Now, if I have a lone pair of electrons, I have an electron cloud. It's got electrons in it. It has a certain force that it is using to push against other electron pairs. And, what we want to do is we want to develop a geometric structure that minimizes these electron pair repulsions. Okay, do either one of you have a little brother? I can say this because I was a little brother. No. Ian? No, only child. Oh, God, so you never had to do the backseat thing. You never had to do oh. the backseat thing where he's touching me. Mm -mm. I'm the younger brother, so. All right, do you remember Home Alone? Yes. Do you remember the movie in Home Alone? Yes. All right, we have the bratty brother. 
the one <laughs> that just wants the things his way. And then we have his older brother that had his nice little room, right? Did right. they want to stay as far apart from one another as possible? Yes. Same thing with electron right. pairs. They want to get as far away from one another as possible. So if I have electron pairs, they act, you consider them like clouds, all right? Whether they're bonding or whether they're lone pairs, they still want to push each other away from one another. So in this particular instance, I have one, two, three, four clouds. They want to get as far away from one another as possible. And when they get as far away from one another as possible, that dictates the shape of the molecule. This is what Vesper is. So in order to do this, we need to get develop a little bit of vocabulary. An electron cloud is any lone pair electron. Each lone pair of electrons count one electron cloud. Single, double, or triple bonds count as one electron cloud. Because if you have a double bond, all of the electrons are located within that axis between the first atom and the second one. And that's what we're trying to develop here. A lone pair is a electron pair that's not involved in bonding. Lone pairs are owned by the atom in which they are residing on. Bonding pairs are the ones that are involved in bonding. All right, so if I am looking at this molecule and I'm counting the number of electron clouds, electron domains, same difference. I have this single bond, one electron cloud. This single bond, another electron cloud. This lone pair, another electron cloud. This double bond, one electron cloud. So I have one, two, three, four electron clouds in which I'm discussing the center molecule A. So this has four electron domains or four electron clouds. Did you understand how I counted those? Yes. Okay. When I'm talking about electron domain geometry, I'm talking about all the electron clouds. When I'm discussing molecular geometry, I only count, I only look at the positions of the atoms. So if I'm dealing with four things around a center atom, I'm dealing with an electron shape of tetrahedron. If each one of those things is an atom, I can see all those atoms, then my molecular shape is going to be tetrahedron as well. If one of the things around my center atom is a lone pair, I can't see those. So the electronic shape is still tetrahedron. But because I can't see it, when I go for the molecular shape, it looks like a three-sided pyramid. So I get the shape trigonal pyramidal. If I have two lone pairs around that shape, I can't see either one of these electrons for the molecular shape. It still has an electronic shape of tetrahedron, but my molecular shape is bent. So to determine the electron geometry, all you gotta do is count the number of electron clouds around the center atom. And then apply the chart I'm gonna give you in a second. Ammonia, one, 
two, three single bonds, one lone pair, four things around it. So my electron domain geometry is tetrahedral. Two electron clouds gives me an electron geometry linear. Three trigonal planar, four tetrahedron. Now we're adding some things now. Up to that point, you know what I'm talking about. Now, if I had five things around my center atom, I have a new shape that you haven't been introduced to before called trigonal bipyramid. If I have six things around it, I have an electronic shape of octahedron. And I will show you what those look like in a few minutes. Now the molecular geometry is going to be what the atoms look like. It doesn't count the electrons. So if I'm looking at water, I don't count this. I don't count this. All I see is the hydrogen going to the oxygen, going back to the hydrogen. I have a bent molecule. Now, riddle me this. Why is it bent and why is it not straight 180 degrees? I don't have a clue. All right. Do you remember I said these guys occupy space? These have an electron cloud associated with them. So do these. So what happens is they push against each other to get as far away from one another as possible. So if I had this, as the H sticking straight out here, and this H sticking straight out here, this electron pair would be pushing against this H, pushing it down. This electron pair would be pushing against this one, pushing it down. They want to get as far away from each other as possible. And because this is a pure charge, this is pure electrons, this is pure electrons, they push down greater than the bonding electrons push back. So you get a bent molecule. Kind of making sense? Yeah, to answer my question from earlier. Ah, okay. What was the question, Ian? Difference between linear and bent and how the heck you decide it. Yes. All right. If I'm looking... They want to get as far away from each other as possible. If I'm looking at two things just attached to a center molecule, they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So I define that by what's known as a bond angle. Two things, they're going to get one, one on one side of the, other, of the center atom, the other on the other side of the center atom. They can't get, much, they can't get any further apart from one another than 180. I add another atom in here, right? So this atom comes in here. It starts to push down at these two. Okay? These two start to push back. So when they push each other away, I now have three things around the center atom equally apart. They're in a plane. The bond angles are 120 degrees away from each other. I add another thing in there, another atom in there, okay? You might think, okay, well, I add another atom in there. I get 90 degrees from one another. But if you do that, guys, you're forgetting about the third dimension. Remember, three points can make, well, three points make a plane. If I add another atom in there, I can employ the third dimension. So if I have another atom up here, what it's doing, if I have these three in a plane, try and picture this, guys. I have these three atoms in this plane, and I have another atom that approaches from out right and it tries to go right at that blue atom. 
What the other atom approaching the blue atom does is it pushes the other three down. When it pushes the other three down, you make this form called a tetrahedron with three kind of pointing down at an angle and one coming straight up. If I then add another atom in there, the best way to arrange these things is to have three atoms in a plane. Each one of them have 120 degrees away from one another. Then I have one atom straight up, another atom straight down. This is trigonal by pyramid. I add another atom in there. I have something called an octahedron where all the angles are 90 degrees from one another. Okay, is this making a little bit of sense now? Remember, each yeah. one of these clouds is trying to get as much room as possible. Kind of making sense? Yes. All right, something you gotta know. If the center atom has a lone pair, the electron domain geometry and the molecular geometry are no longer the same. If the center atom, center atom has no lone pairs, electronic geometry, molecular geometry are the same. If it has a lone pair, they are not the same. And this is where it's time. So this is where I'm going to end, uh, start on, on Thursday, okay? Okay. Questions, we went over a lot. We went through, we reviewed Lewis Dots, the octet rule and violations yeah. thereof. We went through formal charge. We went through uh, polar bonds. We went through resonance. We talked about bond uh, determining enthalpies of reaction on the forming and breaking of bonds. And we started off, we got the basic idea behind uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion. I'll have five but, minutes before my next class. Okay, but I good. just had that one quick question about the, the shells ah. that you were saying at the beginning, beginning of class. Okay, I'm gonna go back to, I'm, I'm going back to, all right, stop share. I'm gonna go back to a periodic table, which is gonna be here. This is the closest periodic table I know of. If I can find it again, nope, 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 nope. there we go. Okay, all right, Gabe. Okay, what's the question, Gabe? No, uh, you were just talking, and then you were just saying how like a like a three P uh, shell. I just got I got kind of confused with the shells. Like just okay, all right. What you were saying? Let's, let's go back and do a little bit of quantum review. All right. All right. Now N, the N number stands for the principal uh, principal shell number. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, right. if you want to think about Niels Bohr's atom, that would be like the first shell having two electrons in it, the second one eight, the third one eight, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what the N is. What the L is, is that defines them into the shape of the individual orbital, okay? That was, if okay. L is zero, you have an S, which is spherical. If L is one, you have a P, which is dumbbell-like. L is two, that's the D orbitals where you have like the pinching twice and you have like a clover leaf of the right. orbitals. Does that make sense to you? Yes. All right, now, when N, L's, L's values, the value of L can only be N minus one down to zero integers. So if N is one, L can only have a value of zero. Mm-hmm. If N is two, L can have a value of one and zero. Right. If N is three, 
L can have a value of two, one, or zero. Okay. So if I'm in the second shell here, right? If I'm in the second shell, I have no L equal to value. I have no D orbitals to draw from. Okay. So oh, okay. I have no D orbitals to draw from. So right, because it's only two D, two S. Oh no, my there God. is no two D. There is no two D. I mean two S, two P, two S, two P. That's what I meant to say. So if I'm on this level, I have to obey the octet rule. Oh, uh, okay. But if sorry, I go I, down I knew I was one missing level, something. I'm sorry, Gabe. I knew I was missing like some small thing. I'm like, but let me just go over it anyway. Because come on. <laughs> but yeah, that makes sense. Well, basically, I have if I have sulfur, and you have to understand that sulfur has 3D orbitals it can draw upon. Nitrogen has no 2Ds to draw upon. Does that make sense? Yes. The orbitals all exist. If I have a hydrogen, I have a 1s orbital, I have a 2s, I have a 2p, I have a 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d. I have all the, those orbitals all exist. Okay? All right. Mm -hmm. But the 2s is too far from the 3d to draw, to use those orbitals. Whereas the, th the 3P is real close to the 3D and it can draw upon those. Does that make a little more sense to you, Gabe? Yes. Yeah, it makes so much more sense. Finest kind. You said a couple things. That it? Yeah, I'm sorry. The, you, oh, I, yeah. I thought you said you had a couple things. No, no, that, that was it. Just the shells and what you were saying, but that makes so much more sense. Good enough. Ian, does, are you okay, Ian? Yeah, I just got questions on grades. I was just waiting until he was done. Okay, no problem. I will. Uh, Gabe, if you don't mind, if I'm talking with, if you don't have anything more, what I'm going to do is I'm just talk with uh, Ian in a second and stop the recording. All right. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ian. Yep. You guys have a nice day. You have a good day, too, okay? Okay, now I got to get this. All right. Sorry, I'm trying to find where I'm... Oh, it's all good. Well, I... No, I... Uh, no, no, not new share. Stop share. Okay?